I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is Leo Murray from the organisation Possible. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. So um, my name is Leo Murray. I am a director at the climate change charity Possible, and I'm going to try to talk you through some of the options <coughs> for reducing the expected growth in demand for air travel. So um, the basic problem is simple, and that is that on current trends, we're expecting a lot more flying in the future than we can fit inside this net zero target. And now that is even with a lot of assumptions about the technology improving that we've, uh, we've, we've, we've heard a bit about. Even if technology does improve and we're quite optimistic about those assumptions, we're still looking at a lot, a much more growth in air travel than is permissible if we're trying to meet this net zero target. So the government is forecasting about 50% growth, but the Committee on Climate Change is saying that, yes, air travel can grow, but not by more than 25%. So we're looking at twice as much growth in air travel as we can fit inside this budget, even with a lot of uh, good technology improvements. Now, this is not an easy thing to do to manage demand down to within that safe limit. Um, and there are two kind of areas of key challenge if you're trying to do this as a policymaker. The first is around cost. And that is, fundamentally, there are a lot of quite generous tax breaks that have kept the cost of air travel artificially low relative to other forms of transport. Um, and, of course, people have become accustomed to cheap flights. And, uh, it's, you know, it's very difficult if you're a politician to roll that back. But we know that almost whatever happens, air travel is going to have to become more expensive in some way. So that's the first challenge. And then the... The second area of challenge is the international nature of air travel. It just does make it difficult for a national government to implement effective policy on this. Um, and the second half of that problem is that, you know, in an ideal world, we'd be solving this at a global level. But the United Nations has a global regulator on air, on air travel, and they are not doing their job properly. So um, I will talk a bit more about that in a bit. So. Taxing air travel, at the moment, international jet fuel is completely untaxed. So it's totally free from tax, and it's been that way since the 1940s. There's a set of international agreements called the Chicago Convention, and most governments see the Chicago Convention as a legal block on them taxing jet fuel. But for comparison, and this is important, if we were in the UK to tax jet fuel at the same rate that you and I pay for petrol at the pump when we go to refill a car at a petrol station, I would add about £43 to the cost of a return flight to Barcelona or £200 to New York and back. So um, you're talking about a very big difference there. Now we also, uh, plane tickets are 0% rated for VAT. And now that is alongside other items, things like wheelchairs and baby clothes are 0% rated for VAT. Uh, so is air travel. Um, for comparison, you know, there are items that have a reduced rate of VAT, like tampons, where you pay 5%, um, or solar panels, or bicycles pay the full 20%. So it gets a very generous tax treatment. Now, what we do do in the UK is we charge something called air passenger duty. Um, we charge that on most flights that are departing from UK airports and nearly all passengers pay the reduced rate of £13 for short haul for a short trip within Europe or £78 for a long haul flight. Now APD, our passenger duty, it raised just over £3.5 billion for the Treasury at last count but it would need to be three times this high to make up for the fuel duty exemptions and the 0% rating for VAT. So Effectively, if we were taxing air travel in the same way that we tax other goods and services, we would be taxing, we'd be taking about seven and a half billion pounds more from air passengers each year. Um, now, we have to have a slight diversion here for a moment to talk about carbon offsetting. I don't think it has come up yet in this process, but it's very important in the conversation around air travel. So this is the practice of increasing emissions in one place from one source, but paying for them to be reduced by the same amount somewhere else for another source. So in theory, that neutralizes the emissions that you've created. That's, that's the theory behind carbon offsetting. The aviation industry and lots of industries prefer offsetting um, as an alternative to reducing emissions from air travel. So it's important to understand 
Offsetting does not reduce emissions from air travel. It's an alternative to doing that. Instead of reducing emissions, you pay somebody else to do it. The big problem with it is that the evidence that it actually works is very, very poor. There's, there's not time in this presentation to go into the details of that. Happy to fill questions on it. Um, there is a big carbon offsetting plan. So when I said the UN global regulator is not doing their job properly, this is what I meant, um, they're not really regulating to reduce emissions from air travel. Um, they are planning to introduce an enormous offsetting scheme that will add a few pence to the price of a plane ticket in 2030. Um, it's not really touching the sides of this. Now, carbon pricing is something different from offsetting, and that is where businesses pay for permits to emit carbon, where the price set, so the upper limit of those emissions is capped. And we do have something in Europe at the moment for intra-EU flights. It's called the EU Emissions Trading Scheme. That adds a pound or two to tickets at the moment. If and when the offsetting scheme is introduced, the aviation industry wants that scheme scrapped and replaced by the offsetting one. Um, it's important to understand that that prediction the government has, a 50% growth in air travel, it factors in a carbon price. It factors in a carbon price of over £200 per tonne in 2050. And that has an effect on demand. But it's important to understand that there are th that's not an actual policy and there are no policy plans in place to introduce that level of carbon price. And if we don't get it, then air travel will grow more than 50%. So... What are our options here? Well, the simplest option would be to use air passenger duty. Um, because it is the only existing tax that we levy on air travel today, we could simply turn that up and we can do that quite easily and immediately. A downside of that is that air passenger duty is quite a blunt instrument. It doesn't match the emissions from the flight very well. <coughs> but also, because it's levied on passengers, not planes, it doesn't incentivize airlines to fly more efficiently. It doesn't incentivize them to fly full planes. If you think of things like uh, ghost flights, you know, British Airways used to fly empty planes between uh, Heathrow and Cardiff to hold on to runway slots. And of course, they weren't paying any tax on that because there were no passengers on board. Um, now, another approach that we could take, which uh, Sally touched on, is managing demand through airport capacity constraints. So we have enough runways and terminals at existing UK airports to handle all of the growth in air travel that the Committee on Climate Change says we can fit inside this budget. So, simple thing to do, don't expand our airports. Now, the downsides of this is that uh, Heathrow, of course, is planned to get a third runway. And if we build that third runway, then we would need to constrain airport capacity elsewhere by about 10%. And that, that's a, that would be the equivalent of closing Manchester Airport. Um, it's not just Heathrow, there are 21 airports across the UK that are all planning to expand and together that would add considerably more than 50% capacity <laughs> to uh, the runways and terminals that we have. This is mine and my organisation possible's preferred option would be to manage that demand growth with a frequent flyer levy instead. Now, as we heard from Sally, 15% of people are taking 70% of all the flights. The problem is not really annual family holidays and so on. So this would replace air passenger duty, um, where you would have low or zero tax uh, for one flight per person each year, and then it would just keep going up for each extra flight that you take after that point. That shifts the rise in tax burden uh, onto those who fly the most. Now, we know that some flights in the future have to be stopped, so whose flights are we going to stop? Now, if we rely on just increasing air passenger duty, or carbon pricing, or airport capacity constraints, what happens is most of the reduction in new flights comes from people on below average incomes who rarely fly currently. If you use a frequent fly levy instead, it would mean most of the reduction in new flights comes from those on above average incomes who currently fly a great deal. <coughs> so that's why I prefer it. I think it's, fairer, uh, it's a fairer way of doing it. So just to conclude, it's really clear UK airport expansion at any of our airports, it's not consistent with meeting this goal. We know that price increases are needed, but most options for doing that would hit lower income flyers the hardest. Um, so a frequent flyer levy could be a very effective way to manage that growth in demand for, uh, for flights within the safe limits, but still protecting access to some air travel for all income groups. So annual family holidays, seeing your mum,
uh, you know, in another country, everyone would still be able to do that in this carbon constrained future. Um, the last point is that legislating for a frequent flyer levy might be very difficult to do because nearly all politicians and people who hold power, decision makers, think newspaper editors, you know, business magnates, they're all frequent flyer le flyers themselves. And so, um, you know, we're quite likely to get pushback uh, on this as a solution. Thanks so much. So thank you very much, Leo.